so yeah, I'm going to be working on a 2D animated scene today. Um, part of what we do at CG Spectrum is uh, obviously CG stands for computer graphics, um, but nowadays 2D hand drawn animation is also part of uh, CG. Um, I like to think of it as sort of tradigital. They used to call animation traditional when it was hand drawn. That means if you're drawing with it. Well, if you're drawing with an actual pencil or a real analog pen on paper, they would call that traditional back in the old days when I used to work in the business. And then at a certain point, uh, the line between what was done on a computer and what was done on analog paper became so blurry that eventually we called it tradition, tradigital, uh, tradigital animation. That's a marriage of uh, both digital and analog disciplines. So, um, it fits right in with CG Spectrum, and uh, I teach classes there. My co, Mike Wiesmeyer, he teaches 2D animation there. And then there's a whole spectrum of other CG stuff that you can learn there too in the classes. Uh, sorry about that one. Anyway, um, but today we're going to be just talking about the 2D aspect of things. I've done a lot of 2D animation work for some pretty big studios. You can look me up online if you want to find out where. I'm not going to talk about that too much today. But what I want to do is talk about uh, animation in general and then clean up. Uh, so today, if I go to my work screen, I'm going to be looking at a scene that I'm working on. It's in progress. I started it last week and uh, we'll probably be on it for a little while longer still. Um, animation takes a long time to do. So uh, that's the first thing anybody who wants to learn about animation needs to know is, is that it, it's a time-consuming process. You have to really love it and you really have to uh, have a lot of patience. Um, but if you love it, it doesn't require patience. It requires just simply time. So anyway, I started this scene last week. Um, here is a character that I'm going to be working on mostly today. Uh, depends. Um, depends on what people are interested in, but uh, I thought if I clean this thing up, it's gonna look really sweet. And then in the future, I'll, I'll be working some more on the actual monster. But right now, let me just show you this scene and how I came up with it. Um, just to uh, explain a little bit, the idea was that I wanted to do something that was in the vein of a character that I'm comfortable drawing. And one of my first inspirations was Space Ace a cartoon from the 80s uh, that took the kind of campy look at Disney style. Uh, Don Bluth was a Disney animator who went off and formed his own studio, did a lot of Land Before Time kind of stuff, um, and uh, Secret of Nim. Anyway, he, he branched out and wanted to do his own thing, uh, so he created his own studio, and he did a lot of cool stuff, a lot of stuff that... Mm, Maybe not so cool. I'm not going to make a judgment call on it, but but he kept the flame of animation going, so we like him. But I really, really liked uh, the video games he did in the 80s, which were Dragon's Lair, Space Ace, and eventually Dragon's Lair 2. And I liked it because they it wrote a fine line between actually being very Disney-like and also being a little tongue-in-cheek, a little bit on the campy side, um, cartoony, but with a little bit of an edge. And so uh, I'm working with a character that I designed that's got kind of a Space Ace feel when Space Ace, the younger version of Space Ace called Dexter when he meets his match with his dark side. This is not something I drew. This is something uh, on the screen that somebody from DeviantArt drew. I wish I could credit them. I don't know who did it, but uh, I'm just using this as an inspiration for the character that I came up with. So that's one. Another inspiration that I always cite is Wally Wood. He was a famous uh, cartoonist who worked in, on Mad Magazine in the 1950s before it became the 1970s version that everybody probably knows and loves. Uh, it was a really different kind of comic book form of Mad Magazine that would parody other comic books. And uh, Wallace Wood was a famous cartoonist who actually drew superheroes and then did parodies of superheroes. And so he did uh, Batboy and Ruben, which has actually been made into its own little cartoon that you can see if you just type it online. I don't know who did it, but it's really fun. Worked out really nicely. Um, but I like the idea of masks and the articulation that they give and gloves and, and boots and things. And uh, similar with Space Ace, 
um, the feet are always going to be kind of big and floppy and the hands are big and floppy and I like that. It's easier to draw. Another example of this is uh, from the Ralph Bakshi film Wizards. So Ralph Bakshi was famous as a kind of subversive animator who started out in Terry Toons and, and traditional comic the cartoony stuff and eventually made his way into making the first ever x-rated cartoon now x-rated not because it was naughty well i mean it's very naughty but it's not because it's what you think it is but it's it's a cartoon it could probably play on tv today it's no worse than south park and then maybe a little bit worse but but it was the first cartoon for adults that got branded with an adult rating and um so he became famous and rich well he became famous off of that <laughs> And then he decided to do something a little more, he calls it family friendly, which I think is really funny, but a little less adult, a little more uh, for wider audiences. So he did this movie with trolls and wizards and fairies and monsters and stuff and called Wizards in 1977, the same year that Star Wars, the first came out. A little bit of trivia, Mark Hamill, who does, uh, who is Luke Skywalker, he does one of the voices in Wizards and um, he wasn't allowed to say so because the other film was coming out. Anyway, the point is, is I, I kind of like the characters, um, the design of the characters in that film. And again, they had these big floppy feet, probably because everybody was wearing bell bottoms when the movie was made and they're copying that style. Also because it copies the style of some comic book artists of the time uh, who were drawing these big floppy feet. Also, he may or may not have been copying Wally Wood. They had a little thing going for a while. They were gonna make films together and uh, ended up not doing that. But uh, anyway, so these were some of the references. And then last but not least, uh, I really like this evil Peter Pan. I think that looks cool. It looks like he's got a mask over his head and um, he's got sort of a devious look on his face. So these were just some of the uh, inspirations I used for coming up with this scene. So now I'm just gonna play the scene for you. I've just the character itself and give you an idea of what it looks like so far. Uh, turn off this level and just show you the rough. And probably turn on the color card. When you're using Toon Boom, it help, helps if you turn on the color card. I'm also gonna turn the character's opacity up a little bit so that you can see it better. So just turn up the opacity here. Uh, you can't see it, but on my screen, uh, my second screen, you can see, uh, I'll drag it onto the screen so you can see it. Uh, Toon Boom's great. It gives you the ability to turn the opacity up and down on uh, your work. So now you'll be able to see the hero character a little better. All right, so let's just roll it, see what we got. So this is the work in progress. Um, I animated it a little bit of it uh, last week. And then I moved on to the second character, which was a uh, monster. I'll show that in a sec. Uh, but first, here is some reference video of the character that I'm doing. Um, so I grabbed some military, uh, sorry, some martial arts performance stuff that I just grabbed and kind of cut it together. and. Uh, if I play them both together, you'll see I didn't copy it verbatim. I just used it for reference and um, then added a little stab uh, with a blade, which you don't really see where the blade comes from. It just sort of appears, but uh, that's okay. It's moving fast. Um, so this is my pitch for reference. I always go on and on and on about references. Use it. Use it. It's your friend. It helps. You can only make your work better. Um, but don't go one for one because if you do, it'll look like, uh, thanks Simon, <laughs> it'll look like uh, um, motion capture in 2D with doing motion capture long before motion capture, they called it rotoscoping in their films like uh, The Lord of the Rings that Ralph Bakshi did in 1978. And then there's um, Snow White, the character from the film Snow White. Uh, Sleeping Beauty, the human characters, they used rotoscoping for these and it isn't the most organic looking thing in the world. It looks kind of uncanny, Kenny Valley and a little creepy. Uh, so when you're animating, you don't want to just go one for one. You want to actually uh, animate, get the spirit of the reference, but um, add 
the tools of the 12 principles to it, exaggeration, good staging, timing, slow in, slow out, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to know more about the 12 principles, then you can sign up for CG Spectrum animation classes and you'll learn all about it. Um, but uh, those are some of the things that I applied to this. I'll zoom in on this a little bit tighter so you can actually see what's going on. Um, and what you'll see is, is that some of the drawings are really rough, some of them are a little bit tighter. And that is because uh, some of them are key poses, and then some of them are just in-betweens that I use to flesh out the timing of the scene and make it uh, look like it flows nicely. And I'm going to do even more of that with the cleanup pass, um, which I have already started and will probably continue on with tonight. But let's look at some more fun stuff with the scene. So this was done using a backdrop that I actually stole from the internet. I probably shouldn't say that, but I'm not going to keep this. I'm going to just use this as a temporary layout. Um, so it's a creature. I'm sorry. It's a hero battling something in a cave. And so I just used a, a basic layout background for the cave. I'm just doing this for fun. I would never, ever, ever steal anything. Um, this is, again, just something to use for reference until I come up with a real background for this scene. But I thought it, it worked nicely. All right, next up then, there is the monster that it's fighting. Uh, the monster looks something like this, right now at least. Um, so I worked a little bit on this last week. I'll continue to flesh this out, maybe a little today, maybe a little more next week. Um, like I said, I kind of want to finish off the, uh, the superhero or whatever he is, the hero dude, because I think it'll look really cool. And then I can spend some more time with the monster, which is... Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to play with, to animate some more and, and clean up. So right now the monster is kind of just broken down, um, very rough animation. And I put the tentacles on a separate layer and I was playing around with that a little bit last week. So um, I just wanted the, anim the tentacles to kind of squish and, and morph. And uh, I haven't spent too much time on them. Uh, I'll probably spend some more time on that next time. Uh, but today, I'm probably going to work on the beast a little bit and then definitely going to work on cleaning up the hero character a little. So what's clean up? Clean up is um, one of the most difficult, but one of the most rewarding aspects of animation. Uh, they call it all sorts of things. Assistant animation, final line, um, and then clean up. doesn't matter what you call it. Uh, but what it is, is it's taking the drawings that were uh, rough and turning them into cleaner drawings by applying a really nice line to them. And uh, there's a long tradition of doing this at Disney Studios. Uh, it's sort of an unsung art. It's something that doesn't get recognized all that often. And it's that's a shame because it's... It's a really rich heritage of, um, of art. I, you know, it's, it's, it's an art form in and of itself. And so it's a shame that it doesn't get the recognition it deserves. It's, it, um, it, it requires a, a person to be an animator and to be someone who can render things really nicely. And so uh, you, have to have a, uh, you have to have an aesthetic eye, but you also have to um, understand animation as much as the animator did in some cases. And so you take rough drawings and then you clean them up. So I'm going to do a little of that today. Here is an example of a cleanup drawing that I've done already. So I'll just compare this uh, to how it looks without the rough. So there is how it looks without the rough. Um, it's a vector line, so it'll be easy to paint. And I'll show you a kind of finished example of what it will hopefully look like when the thing is done. Um, but if you get in real tight, you can see vector lines. Like you might find an illustrator um, that you definitely find in Toon Boom. You have the ability to draw either rough with a bitmap pencil or uh, clean up. If you want to know more about this, take a class with us, CG Spectrum. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, these are vector lines which are easily painted. And when it's done, will look something like this if all goes according to plan. Now, in theory, if I really have the time and the patience, I will go in and add some tones and highlights to this, uh, just paint them on. 
I considered making that a part of the actual cleanup animation, but I think it's just too time consuming. Uh, when you look at what this thing is doing, uh, it's a really fast move and it's going to take me long enough uh, just to clean it up as is and paint it. It takes a really long time, as you may see if I do a little bit tonight. But uh, yeah, it'd be sweet if this thing had tones and highlights on it. Um, and there are ways of doing that in Toon Boom, but uh, I'm going to leave that alone for now and just concentrate on making a nice cleanup drawing and uh, then eventually coloring it in. So I've already started cleaning it up. I have, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a few drawings already. And if I could just flip through these, you'll see that these are works in progress. And so just before I get into it and start um, drawing and actually physically drawing some of this stuff. This shows you the importance of the cleanup pass because look at the difference between the cleanup and the rough. This was my rough. This is when I was just animating the scene and just wanted to get the motion out there and just see if this was working. I wasn't paying attention to volumes as much. Um, I wanted my drawings to be really loose and floppy and alive and capture the spirit of it. And uh, you can see what I I went into this in a lot more detail last week. Uh, if anybody ever wants me to go into more detail, I'm happy to do so. Um, but I did go over this a lot last time. This week, I'm getting the thing back on model. So you can see the difference between the rough version and the cleanup version. And that's where the magic of cleanup comes in. And so the idea is I've kind of keyed it off of one of these poses and now I have to make sure it looks consistent, that the volumes start uh, to stay the same while also drawing pretty quickly and trying to maintain the, the liveliness of the original drawings. So that's what I'm going to do for a little while until, um, until I start to go insane and then I'll uh, maybe start drawing the monster a little bit to loosen up. It's important when you're animating that you keep your spirits up and you keep your energy up. Sometimes things can be a little tedious, take a long time. Uh, usually when I'm doing this, I would do it uh, alone in a quiet room and listen to something really fascinating. Well, today I'm just going to talk while I'm doing it and uh, um, just draw while I'm talking and, and share stories or anything I think is interesting uh, along the way. But as always, if anybody is uh, watching who is interested and wants to ask some questions, I'm more than happy to talk about anything that you're interested in. Uh, but Let's talk some cleanup now. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do now is rotate the disc. I talked about this before. Um, holding down Control and Alt, at least on a PC, allows you to flip your drawings around and yet, uh, ultimately, when you play it at speed, they're still going to be uh, right side up. If I zoom out a little bit, you can see that I'm rotating the entire playing field, which you used to be able to do in analog form. And if I go Shift X, it places it back where it was supposed to be, and I can play at speed. So I rotate this thing so I can draw using the curve of my hand. My hand wants to rotate up and to the right because I'm right-handed. And so I can work with this disc mode, and I can get the character into any old shape that I want it to, and just always be drawing in a way that's sort of ergonomically satisfying for my hand. Um, so yeah, disc mode is great. Another thing about this is uh, you may notice I'm not being absolutely perfect with this pass. Um, I'm going to try to avoid getting too caught up in the details because it's a small character in a big scene and it's moving quickly. It's not going to matter too much. If I was doing some serious acting scene, then I want to make sure that this thing is spot on and not a, a moment is left to chance. Um, but, but in this case, uh, I'm not too worried about it. Now, something I can do is I can cut and paste parts from my other drawings and that will keep the drawings consistent. So if I just cut and paste this, I actually just copy and paste this foot and then uh, rotate it into place, then I've just saved myself having to draw something and running the risk of not having it 
be the right volume. Now, having done that, I want to go back and fix it up and make sure that it works into the actual drawing on this layer. But by doing that, I just saved myself from having to uh, draw it again and then potentially drawing it wrong. Now, let's see if I draw this just like this and don't use any other tools. Let's see how it fits. Now, see, there's an example of why I might want to cut and paste. Because look at the difference between the volume, like how it went from being really thin to really thick. And that can, even on a scene that's moving as uh, quickly as this one, that could be a real problem. So I'm going to cut and paste that leg. And I might just cut and paste the whole leg and see how much of it I can get for free. That just means um, I didn't have to draw it. And it's going to do some of the work for me. Now the downside of this is, is if it's too perfect, then it also doesn't look right. So now that I've got this in my scene, I'm gonna readjust some things and get it to line up a little bit before I fix it up some more. So uh, I once had a student say to me, um, well, I have two things the students said to me. One was, uh, boy, animation's actually really hard, isn't it? And I was like, well, I mean, define hard. Is it hard if you're having fun? Uh, it's hard to make things look nice, but that's true of anything. And then the other thing that the student asked me was, is where's the button you push to make it go? And uh, I said, yeah, well, I guess it's up here somewhere. And I'm not sure if there's any other button that makes things go besides that. So I'll finish this off a little bit and then um, just flip back and forth. That's the secret to making stuff look nice is you flip back and forth between your drawings and check volumes and check whether or not uh, the thing looks nice. So I'm, now that I've got the sizes about right, I'm going to clean this up just a little bit more because it's going to bother me if I don't. So just make it a little bit nicer. It's not going to be on the screen for very long, but there's no reason why I can't just make it look a little bit nicer. This is my only chance. Uh, once I've done this pass on this, I'm not going to belabor it too much. And stuff like this can really make me crazy. If I let stuff, certain things go. I did this for many years on uh, big movies. And um, so I'm kind of trained to see things that are really, really off and just go, no, don't fix it, fix it. But that's enough of that. Okay, so now that leg looks like it's working all right. Um, there's some volume changes in there, and so I might want to go fix that up later, but um, since the character is moving a lot, I'm not going to worry about it too much for now. But I am going to connect this back up a little bit more. There we go. Okay, so now I'm going to do the other leg. And I should be able to copy and paste a lot of that other leg, but I don't want to copy and paste the whole thing or else it's going to look kind of cheap. And we used to call it Saturday morning cartoonish. Um, that just meant Saturday morning cartoons were done very cheaply. And uh, in order to do a series, they had to be able to uh, start use stock footage of actions that were done over and over and over again by characters and reuse stuff. And, and it ended up looking kind of cheap. So uh, they called it Saturday morning cartoons. I'm not sure they have Saturday morning cartoons anymore. Uh, I don't know if that's still a thing. Um, but when I was a kid, we lived for it. We actually uh, would get up at the crack of dawn and we'd sit in front of the TV all morning until our moms kicked us out of the house or dads or anybody. And uh, I think that that kind of went away in the 80s. I'm not sure, but uh, I think that that was when it kind of came to an end. All right, so here I have a situation where it's like, eh, might as well just draw it in. Um, but at least now I know um, how to make the feet look like they're the right 
size. So I'm not going to run into trouble later. So if it morphs between this and this, then it's not going to be quite as bad. I'm going to shear a little bit off of the back of the leg. And the caveat too is, is um, because I'm doing this live, I probably will go back and fix some of this stuff up later, but I just want to show how it works. It's like a cooking show where they put it in the oven and then they take it right out again and say, so see, so three hours later, there it is. So now, just put the character's top of the boot there and finish off the leg and then I'll move on to another one. So here I just want to take a look at the leg thicknesses and make sure that I keep it pretty consistent. Again, I could theoretically just cut and paste it. We'll see if I can just draw it. Sometimes it's faster. So yeah, that's fine. All right, so now before I move on, I'll just compare these. I'm also going to just turn the background off. Don't need it for what we're doing, just cluttering things. Turn off the rough layer and just look at the cleanup layer and see if there's anything else that I missed. So, yeah, here's a situation where I'm actually, as a cleanup person, I'm going to go in here and fix something up because it just doesn't look right. So that leg just gets really short and it just looks kind of crummy. And this is something that you deal with in cleanup all the time is you'd have animation that either wasn't complete or it worked really good when it was rough. And then you uh, had to go back in and fix it up as a cleanup person. And so um, I always talk about the working on Pocahontas where we had to work with her hair and her hair was supposed to be like fire and uh, which was great when it was animated by uh, Glenn Keane, who's just the most amazing, brilliant animator in the world. But when we went to clean it up, it was really difficult to try and figure out how to make that work and uh, fun, but challenging too. So I'm going to just give his leg a little bit of a bend and hopefully that will make it a little more healthy looking so it doesn't morph too much when it changes. Let's see how that looks. That's a little better. And I may go back and fix that up another time, but, but you get the idea. All right, so let's move on and do some another one and uh, try that. <laughs> All right, so I'm getting up at 5 a.m. to watch Digimon. Okay, so, um, so yes, it still exists. That's cool. Or did. All right, so I've broken some of these down. Do that one, that's a fun one. I'm gonna do one that's a little more fleshed out. How about this one, that'll be fun. Okay, so here's another cleanup. Um, start by just making a line and that will fill in the blanks for me so I can go assign this key designation and then flip between the first key and this one. So theoretically, I could probably use some of the information from the character's face and copy and paste it, but definitely use the ear. That's something I can steal from the first drawing. So place the ear in the scene and then rotate it, move it into place. And then that way I can keep the volume 
uniform without spending too much time and effort. There's another way to keep things uniform. I'm not showing it yet, but I'm gonna in just a little bit. And that's one of the fun things about Toon Boom is how you can take things off the pegs and uh, look at volumes and try and keep more consistent. And so, but I'm not gonna do it just yet. We'll leave you in suspense and do that uh, when I need it. This one is just gonna be a fun drawing. I don't need to worry too much about keeping the volumes straight. So I'm just gonna draw this one. Now I have the smoothness pretty high, so I'll turn that down because I'm drawing uh, facial stuff, then I want to make sure that the smoothness is, is not too high or else it'll uh, it will want to assign drawing connections that I really don't want to have assigned. So here we go, so six. There's always the question, should I go in and fix a line or should I just go back and redraw it? That's something that you just have to get used to um, when you're doing a cleanup pass. Is it worth it to try and fix it up or is it better to just carry on and uh, leave it the way it is? All right. so. One thing that I like about drawing in a more of a Don Bluthy style is, is that there are a lot of corners and things to hang other lines off of. And so um, that's one of the reasons I gave this character a mask is so that uh, it would have lots of sharp edges to connect stuff to. This music is ridiculous. All right. Okay, so um, it's good to look at all the drawings that I've got and just compare as I go, but oh, hold on for that just for one more second. So what I want to do is just make sure that the hair clump is going to stay the same volume and that it kind of keeps its overall style, persistence of vision, and the fact that it's going to be the same color that will buy me some uh, room. But at the end of the day, I really need to just make sure that the shapes are that are fitting nicely. So I'll just take a quick second here and, and look. Let's see, well, I had this one where the hair was flipping a lot. So there's a lot of hair here on this character. I've designed it so he's got a really big flop of hair and it can do all sorts of crazy things. Um, so I might give this just a little bit more volume than it currently has. But I also like the way it articulates like forming that C shape so I don't want to get rid of that too much but I'll just give it more more volume right in here. Again that's part of the cleanup house. I'm going to hold off on doing the eyes because I'm doing them in a different color. Uh, so they'll pop a little bit. If you look at the cleanup version again, um, you can see that the eyes pop because I've drawn them in black. And uh, then I specifically made them this color so that they'll also pop um, against all the black and white and gray. Uh, but since I'm drawing them in a separate color, I'll hold off and doing that.
Now, in a case like this, where I've got the arms and I've got these two conflicting lines, I did it on purpose just to show, oh, you can cut off the ends of lines like so. Um, so that's, again, part of the debate of, well, how much detail do I put into it on the first pass? Do I go in and clean it up after? Um, is it faster for me to just go in here with an eraser and just cut off the ends, or is it faster to use a cutter tool? Uh, fast is good because there's a limited amount of energy you can devote to something like this before you start to get sick of it, or just want to do something else, or you just your quality starts to go down as you get more fatigued. Now this is a bit of an exaggeration drawing. So I'm gonna splay his fingers out a little bit and make them a little thicker than I would. Uh, I used an exaggeration drawing because it was moving really quickly. If you look at this in context, it's moving really fast and you only get one frame of this hand like that. So I wanted to, to kind of accentuate that pose, so you really see it when it flies by its speed. Now, do the chest. And you should be able to see just a little bit of the emblem on his chest. And then he's got a collar that's going to be a separate color. So we're going to fix up his shoulder a little bit. That's not working anymore. Let's get rid of the whole thing, redraw it. I wanted him to have fairly big biceps because he's supposed to be strong, but I also wanted to keep the idea that he's sort of younger and kind of teenaged. Let me just fix this up. All right. And then compare leg sizes. So his legs are compressing so that they should get probably a little bit thicker than I actually drew them here. But not too much, because again, he's supposed to be kind of a kid. And then because this is moving so much, I can be pretty safe in just drawing this part because it's not gonna matter. Um, it, it's, it's not that close to the original drawings, drawing one. Um, it's changed a lot since then. It's in motion. It's not, it's not really gonna be even seen. It'll only be seen if something really weird is going on. If uh, all of a sudden he grows this, you know, another foot or something. Uh, other than that, it's moving so fast through all this that uh, you, won't, you won't notice it. And the idea is you don't want to notice it. You want it to look like it's one character who's moving in space and not a series of drawings that are flipping by. As I say when I talk about actually animating things. I'm going to do this hand. Again, I've got a lot of leeway with this hand because it's not going to be seen. It would only, it'll only really matter if, um, I mean, nobody's ever going to be able to count the amount of fingers he has on his hand or anything. It'll only matter if it looks so completely different from the other drawings of the hand that it looks like it doesn't belong, that it wasn't uh, a continuation of the character moving, that it was another 
hand altogether of some other character. So I'm playing pretty pretty loose with the hand. But I will definitely flip this and see if it's still holding together or if it's looking like it's a different character. All right, now I've got everything drawn in with the black. I'm going to go in and do, or with the brown, then I'll go in and do the uh, eyes with black. And the reason I used brown was because uh, it makes it look a little bit softer. So in the olden days, when we used to Xerox, um, they would use a brown outline so that you couldn't see the hard edges as much, so that it actually softened the edges and made it look a little bit more organic looking, I guess, is the, the, the word. And I think, yeah, move it. And then lastly, I'm going to go in and do his weapon, whatever it is. It's a staff and it's approximately 16 pixels. And if I hold down shift, then I can draw a straight line. It's just like Photoshop or other programs. And I'm just going to fudge this area behind his back a little bit. It's not going to even show. All right, so straighten that out. Solo this layer so I can compare it to the other drawings. Yeah, so far so good. Um, he's got a line around his waist, though, that I did not draw when I was roughing it out. So I'll just put that in real quick, clean up that line on the hand. And on to the next. So again, I can use the cutter tool to just get rid of stray lines like this. Let's see if that works. Sometimes it doesn't pick it up. There it did. All right, so then I'm just gonna draw a line around his waist. And compare it to the previous. Just make sure there's nothing too egregious wrong with it. And then move on to the next. So one thing that I talked about last week um, was chart. And this character has been charted completely. And that's just something that I recommend doing when you finish up your animation because um, you need to know where you're going where you're uh, coming from so if you look to the right side on the screen you can see that there are all these charts set up for this character i've gone through and done the entire character and made sure i understood um, which drawings i did in which order and how they relate to each other for example here's an example of a half so Let's look at this one. So 36 is halfway between 34 and 40. And then 35 is halfway between 34 and 36. And that's how I'm keeping track of not only which drawings I've done and which order I'm doing them in, but how they relate to each other, how close or far one drawing is from the next one. And uh, it's really important that you get comfortable doing charts so that you can follow yourself up, so that you could follow somebody else up. Um, in the olden days when we were animation assistants. And so, uh, you know where you're at. Let's say you come back to a scene and it's been six weeks and you're not sure where you started, where you left off. Well, if you have charts set up, then you always know what your pattern was, what your workflow flow was. So um, charts is something it's easy to forget about, easy to, to neglect, but something that you should keep in, in mind when you're doing 2D animation. In CG, 3D animation, they don't do this anymore. I know of at least one animator who's very famous who's come up with a way to use charts in his CG animation work. Um, but uh, for most people, they don't use charts anymore. And, and that's, I have mixed feelings about it. I think it's really helpful. But when you're doing CG animation, you get a lot of stuff for free. Uh, Maya, for example, will give you in-betweens. And so you don't, need to 
get micromanaging with Maya about, well, are you in betweening this whole thing on a half, 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 half? You look at it, it's working. You know what your keys are because they have ticks, red ticks in the timeline. And uh, you can go from there. And if you know your curve editor, that is the equivalent of uh, knowing charts. And so in this case, in 2D animation, I absolutely have to know what order I did my drawings in and how they relate to each other. And so uh, charts are still a great way of doing that. And uh, highly recommended that you get used to them if you want to do 2D animation and get good at it. Uh, but I'm just worried about the keys right now, so I don't have to um, think too much about it. Uh, just find my key poses, which I, that's all I'm going to do today is just the, the fun key poses. And uh, then next time when you show up, uh, if you come back to watch more of this, uh, hopefully I'll have most of the cleanup done by then. And you can see how it turned out. All right. So let's look for another fun key pose now that I've done this one. Looks like one of these ones up in the air. That could be pretty fun. And his face is showing, so it'll be fun too. So I'll do one more of these, and then I think I'll probably move on to the monster and, and play with that a little bit, because that'll be fun to look at. All right, so here's another key pose. I'm just going to wing most of this, except for the face. Let's look at the face and see if there's anything that I can steal. I always like to start by just making a mark. Now I've got a key. I'll mark it as a keyframe using uh, the keyframe frame uh, marking. And now I can flip between my first drawing and this one. They're pretty close, but there's a different angle. So maybe what I'll do is, is I'll cut and paste it and then just use it as reference. So I don't have to keep cutting and going back and forth between these two frames. But I don't think I can get that much out of it. And again, it's on the frame, it's on the screen for uh, you know, a 12th, in this case, I think a 24th of a second. So I'll just copy this, place it next to this one. And if there is anything that I can steal, um, then I can just cut it and paste it in place. Probably can steal that ear. So just move it over. And then I bet I could steal this nose. So rotate it into place. So it matches the angle. And then I'm going to steal just the base of the jaw. Now let's try the whole thing, see if that'll work. <clears throat> Rotate it and try to place it in here and because I've lost some volume. Um, when I roughed this out, I was going straight ahead through this section. And so I, I lost a little bit of volume with the head. So this way I can maintain that volume and keep it from shrinking too much. And then if I keep this over here on the right, uh, that'll remind me of how big this is supposed to be. So I just saved myself a little bit of extra drawing there by cutting and pasting. And again, I highly urge my students to do this whenever they get to the point of cleaning up. It just is gonna save you a lot of time and effort later. All right, so now that I've got that set up, I'll draw in some of the other details. Also, too, I always say, you know, drawing characters that you're familiar with so that uh, when it comes to this point, you don't have to reimagine the character every second time you draw it. So widening out the face a little bit and then I always tell people this is kind of a scary story, so I don't know. I should share it or not, but I tell people that uh, when I was doing cleanup for a living for a few years, um, I would get so close to, to the actual paper that I accidentally cut my eye. I'm sorry, <laughs> That's, I don't know how else to say it. I accidentally uh, slit 
um, into my eye with the edge of the paper and, and uh, it didn't really hurt that much. I went, I didn't even go to the doctor until a day or two later. The doctor said, um, you cut your eye and I go, yeah, I know. And he goes, well, what did you do after that? I said, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Sorry, Nadia. <laughs> and so I said, um, uh, well, it didn't hurt that bad. So I didn't go to the doctor and it healed up just fine and, and nothing really came of it. But uh, every time I go to get my eyes checked, the doctor will say, did you cut your eye? And I tell him why. And he kind of goes, oh, you worked in animation. Oh, that's interesting. I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and then we forget all about cut eyes as everyone should. So sorry, didn't mean to bring that horrific visual, but, um, but that was just one of the hazards of the trade. I would get so close <laughs> yeah, sorry, Simon. <laughs> I would just get so close to the paper that uh, I had an accident. But like I said, I was uh, just fine. Didn't even really think about it later. So, yes, I agree. Computers are much safer. And uh, now, the only risk we have is what we we can go blind. I've been told. Hey, hey, hey. Um, if you, you're supposed to wear blue block glasses, which we have a pair of those, I just don't wear them because I'm bad, I guess. But I do wear a mask, so at least I get some things right. When I go out in public, I mean. Um, all right, so it's filling in some of the... All right, so I'm just going to wing it with the eye when I get to it. Um, I'm not sure I can use any of this. I don't know. Actually, maybe I can. We'll see. All right, but I'm going to draw the hair. That's always really fun because the hair is covering up a lot of the face. So I may not even have to draw the eyes. So it's got this big swoop up here, comes down, and then his bangs come into his mask. Yeah, do a little better than that. I like to tell people that um, when I was at my best, I could actually draw big swoops. So zoom in on this a little bit. So I could draw something like his body, uh, just like that. I can't do it now, obviously, but um, I got really good at it because I just did it all the time. And so big swoopy things like that, I just draw them in one and I'd, I'd have the whole thing, like Pocahontas' hair, for example. I'd just do it in one big long swoop and uh, didn't think twice about it. Now, I'm not sure I could do that. Plus, there was a roughness to the paper that made it easier to keep your bearing. This is like drawing on glass. And uh, while I like it, and I love the fact that you can smooth out with your stylus and change thicknesses and things, but there was something to be said about the tangibility of paper that made it really easy to draw. Once you got used to grinding things into paper the way we did. All right, so I'm going to try and cut away some of this stuff using the cutter tools. See how nicely that works. It just zaps the lines. If it works out, um, it's great. If it takes too long, then it's not worth it. And you, know, you should just go in and erase it or redraw it or whatever. But like I'm doing here, if you can just get rid of stuff quickly and efficiently by using the cutter tool, uh, why not? One thing that people don't know too is um, how much, how rough the original drawings that we would work with when we worked with paper, how rough they'd be. Uh, they wanted us to just wear the thing down almost to parchment because that's a sign that we were actually um, doing our job, which was to plus the animation. And that we were looking through uh, our desks at the original animation and um, erasing it our work until it absolutely captured the feel of the original animation. And so racing was always a really good sign that you were doing a good job. So kind of let's look at this one in context and see, yeah, his hair's going to curl up there. So I want to keep that. That was actually kind of fun. So 
you know, redraw some of this and recapture the essence of that spiky part and get rid of some of the other stuff around it. And that's what's fun about hair when it's moving really fast. And that's why Glenn Keane had such a good time with Pocahontas is the, if you look at the original roughs, which I think you can find online, they're just amazing because they really do look, it looks like her hair is made of fire. And uh, he wasn't worried about the cleanup. So he just had carte blanche to just make it look really beautiful. And there's this, the colors of the wind sequence. Again, I don't know if anybody's even seen this. Uh, it's been a few years. But this fantasy sequence, Colors of the Wind, and, and uh, that was Glenn Keane getting to draw in charcoal the way he always wanted to in the first place. And you can see that in the uh, cartoon short that he did with, uh, was it Kobe? That won the Oscar, where he was able to draw in charcoal again for that film. Uh, so it's, it's like his favorite medium. Not that he and our best buds or anything. I just remember at the time, a lot of people were talking about it. I met him. I dealt with him. Uh, I learned a lot from him, but I didn't work for him personally. I worked for James Baxter personally, very briefly, but he was a real quiet person, um, but he didn't have to say much. Everything he said was kind of genius. So he was responsible for the horses in Spirit, obviously, and then Tangled. He did the horse in that. He's still doing horses today. Taught us how to draw horses for Spirit. Uh, but also taught us a lot about how to do animate dialogue. Um, just everything. And just what a cool person to spend some time with. Is that why he was a horse in Adventure Time? Probably. That would make sense. Yeah, he was far known far and wide for his horse abilities. And I'm not sure, actually. I don't know that, whether he actually really loved horses uh, by nature or if he just fell into it. If that was just something that he ended up doing or if it's something that he requested and really wanted to do i don't know I mean, he was such an easygoing nice guy it's hard to say speaking of adventure time i'm not even sure if that show is still on or not but it seems to have kind of ushered in a new revolution in animation, at least as far as I could tell. Um, it made people excited about it. It's finished, okay. Yeah, it, um, it got a lot of people I know excited about animation who were not into it at the time and became into it because they just thought it was so cool and random and weird, which I couldn't agree more. And that's, Community the art style from Midnight. Oh, cool. We were talking earlier today about anime in our one of our meetings and um, how cool it would be to get somebody who actually is sort of an anime master at CG Spectrum. Because as much as I love anime films, um, I've never worked on any. And it's not a style that I grew up with. It's not a style that I incorporated into my work as much as I wish I would have. Um, I'm kind of set in my ways now, but uh, I just think it's fascinating. And I know a lot of people are really really into it people were raised with the shows um, that they were raised with uh, and it'd be great to meet the needs of that demographic for people who want to learn it however the caveat is I always say um, 
anime is very stylized and uh, what we teach at CG Spectrum is classic Disney style animation. Well, it's much easier to go one way. <laughs> That's awesome. Studio Trigger. It's uh, easier to go from the classical style to a very stylized look. Uh, for example, TV animation. It's easier to go that way than it is to actually uh, go the reverse. So you can learn classical animation style and then apply that to more manga stylized characters and anime style animation. Uh, it's a little bit easier to do that than it is to go the other, other way around, um, we have found. So learn the one and you can apply it to the other. But, um, but I definitely am excited about that. And I know a lot of people are, and it would be great to get that as an option as well. I don't know that anybody really teaches that style in the West. Um, people that I've dealt with, they've all been self-taught because they just love it so much that they've learned how to do it. And um, I don't know that they learned it right. They just learned it the way that they learned it. And so it would be great to have somebody who actually really understands it. I often tell the story about how um, we were supposed to have I believe it was that's how bad I am. I believe it was Miyazaki was going to come to our to DreamWorks our studio. It was my studio at the time, many years ago. Um, come to DreamWorks and do this dystopian future universe movie that was very anime-like, but yet still had the DreamWorks seal of approval as far as the animation goes. I imagine it would have been something like anime, but fully fleshed out. Uh, into twos, uh, you know, the, the more fluid looking Western animation style, but with the uh, kind of anime style imposed on it. The problem is, is that right about the time we were going to do it, Atlantis came out, or at least they were working on it, and it didn't, didn't happen. And a lot of us were very disappointed about that because it would have been really fun to work on something as different as that. But certainly Miyazaki didn't need us <laughs> at DreamWorks. He was able, perfectly capable of making his own films and uh, making, doing, being very successful with his style and his studio. probably should stop telling that story. I'm sure I signed a contract that says I'm not allowed to talk about stuff like that. Well, it's public domain. You can look it up. Um, I can tell this story. This is one of my favorites of oh, people find this to be one of their favorites is I was working at a studio, I'm not going to say which, because uh, I did learn my lesson, but I was working at a studio and it was right when Internet Movie Database was becoming a thing and people would talk on Internet Movie Database like they do now on um, other platforms. And somebody had asked a question, how come a film I worked on cost so much money? And so I went on there theoretically anonymously and I said, oh, I'll tell you exactly why it costs so much money and went on and on and on. And somebody approached me on Internet Movie Database anonymously and said my name and said, you do realize that you signed a non-disclosure contract, didn't you? You do, you do know that, right? And um, you need to take this post down immediately with all these secrets uh, about how the film was made behind the scenes. So. I learned my lesson. Um, I also realized it's like I didn't want to be the type of person who goes around saying stuff like that. What difference does it make? Um, but that was a real wake up call to me that Hollywood takes their film and their contracts very seriously. So don't mess with them. And again, why would I want to? Um, but again, this is many, many, many years ago and I didn't know any better. I have since learned my lesson.
and see the logic of it as well. All right, so I'm just finishing up the face. I want to kind of keep the same expression that I had on this face, but it's a little bit more three quarter. That eye is kind of off. I'm going to try drawing it again a little bit lower this time. You really, really won't see this on screen for very long, but it's just something I feel like doing. So that looks a little bit better. So the staff is behind his arm. It's 16 pixels thick. And I just draw it by holding down the shift button as I draw the line. And then it creates a thick line like that. So I'm going to get rid of this extra junk. And then I'm going to stop doing cleanup and start playing around with the monster a little bit just for, for laughs for the rest of the time here. But let's look at this, let's see what we got so far. So in an hour, I was able to do about two drawings. You can do the math, that's how long it's going to take to finish this off, which obviously, again, I'm not going to do it in real time here, but um, at least you get an idea of what the cleanup process is like and how long, it, when you do see this finished, assuming it ever gets finished, uh, how long it will have taken to finish it based on time we spent here. And again, I'm talking while I'm doing this, which I wouldn't ordinarily do. Ordinarily, I'd go into a zone and listen to something really cool, like, hey, like a CG Spectrum Twitch stream. Wow, those are cool to listen to while you're working. <laughs> and uh, um, work while I was doing that. Speaking of which, um, for anybody who is listening right now and who's not a CG Spectrum staffer, um, we do these all the time. And some of them are just general conversations. Some of them are about really cool topics. If you go onto the webpage, you'll see a listing uh, of the different Twitch streams that are happening. And uh, you can find whatever you're interested in. You can watch some of that and have some fun. It's a relatively new thing at CG Spectrum to have Twitch streams, um, but it's a lot of fun to see all the different disciplines and see the things that people share. All right, so here you go. That was cleanup pass in case you missed it. Um, this is what it's gonna look like when it's done. It'll have the ink and paint added. And then depending on how it goes, if I'm done with this and I'm not sick of it yet, I may add some tones and highlights and make it even more fun, but that's what it'll, this pass will look like when it's done, uh, which is the pass without the actual rough below it. But uh, yeah, I'm going to save this, lock up the cleanup, and uh, work on the monster a little bit just because it's fun. So just double check, make sure that's saved. I, I uh, recommend versioning up periodically. I'm not going to version up right now because I haven't really done that much. But let's take a look at the beast and see what's going on with that. See if there's anything fun I can do with it. It's so probably what I'll do with the beast is I'm going to clean it up a little bit as I go and flush it out a little bit too. But let's look at it. So right now the situation is uh, I mean, the beast is on two separate levels, one for the tentacles and one for the body. And it's at various stages of sort of tie down, they call it. It's where I'm tying down the keys that I've already done and making sure that they fit in with each other. And then once I've done that, uh, or actually in this case, while I'm doing that, I'm looking for drawings that need to still be done and maybe filling in some of those as well. Looks like I was about here, that's where I left off. So I'm gonna go ahead and fix this one up a little bit. 
and adjust my interface a little. And turn on the onion skin and see what I got. So these are pretty loose drawings um, and they're gonna stay loose for a while. So all I really wanna do now is just make some choices about timing and placement and just make this look a little bit more model. So working with these. So here's the arc of the eyes. There, the head's rotating a little bit. So there's one, there's two, here's the in-between. So in between its eyes, so it's starting to shut them. This is probably the most fun part because I can just be really loose and not stay on model too much. But if it goes too far off model, then it's not going to look right. So that's why I'm, part of what I'm doing is I'm tying it down and making some decisions. For example, he's got two outside teeth. And then just a mess of teeth inside. When I clean this up, I'll worry about the inside teeth more. But the two outside teeth, they help define the shape. And then I'm adding the tongue. And then making sure the head shape itself isn't getting too big or too small as I go. And then things like the antenna. So right now his head's looking a little too big. So I'll just tone that down. Add some of the profile. And then I'm also looking at these antenna shapes, making sure that they in between nicely from one to the other. So I've said this before, just keep stressing it, that your best bet is to flip. That means you go from one drawing to the next and that's how you can tell if things are working or not. But you can tell a lot by doing the onion skinning. You can tell a lot uh, by looking at the drawings underneath and looking where you've been and where you're going with your drawings. But ultimately it's got to flip. If it doesn't flip, if it doesn't work when it's moving at speed, then um, then it's not working. You just have to fix it. So his eyes have gotten a little too big. I'll tone that down. Again, talking about a drawing that's going to be on the screen for a second, but the tighter I make this tie down, the easier it will be to clean it up later. So I'm going to add these thick bags under its eyes so it looks like it's pointing to a squint. That's a little better. Yeah, it's got kind of an underbite. Just take some of that off and give it jowls. So I imagine this thing is sort of a snail slug with fangs. I can't think of anything more horrifying than going into the garden and seeing a snail or a slug and it's got fangs. That would just, just about be the worst nightmare I could imagine. And there are plenty of others, but but that that's a pretty bad one in my book. And then a lot of this will be left to clean up when I go to that pass. But again, I want to make sure and get as tight as I can with this without burning through too much energy, worrying about 
specific details, which aren't going to matter in the big picture. So these necklines are pretty important. They're going to help sell the squishiness of this. All right, that's a little better. Next. So this was breakdown drawing. And let me try cutting and pasting the uh, doing a Taking this out the pegs because it's it's interesting. Uh, it's a lot of work for something that I'm not really gonna need. I don't really need to do that with these, but I'm, I think I'll just do it for fun. To see if it works. So I'm gonna take these three drawings and see if I can make this happen. So these three drawings, I've sent them to the desk, and then now I'm going to shift and trace them if I can. And this is another one of these things that probably works better if you're uh, doing it when you're in the zone. It's kind of hard to explain this process. It's goofy, um, but it's wonderful. So what I'm doing is, is I'm going to take, if it works, uh, take these drawings and I can rotate and place this so that it's on top of the other one. And it also it's touchy, I've noticed, as far as um, sometimes it doesn't rotate for some reason, I'm not sure, quite sure why, but so I've got this drawing and then I've got this drawing and I'm going to try and place this one on top of the other one. There we go. Now it's rotating. So I can rotate this and place it roughly over the other one. And then if I go in between the two, then I can place this one, same thing, and get this one to line up with those other two, and then uh, do it in between on one on top of the other. So I want to make sure this one's a little bit more laid in. Gotta, like I said, this I'm not sure this is the best thing to do as a demonstration because it may not make sense, um, but I'm placing drawing number three over drawing number one, and then I'm going to place drawing number two over the top of those. Like I said, there we go. So fit this one over the top best I can. It's pretty close. Let me rotate it just a little bit. And then um, and you can see why I wouldn't not necessarily do this with rough because um, for a rough drawing, it's like, eh, it just has to be close. But for a cleanup drawing, um, this becomes elemental as part of the process of making sure that everything looks like it lines up right. Yeah, my rotation just doesn't want to work today. So normally when you click on these pegs, um, you'll get a rotation icon and then you can rotate this and lay it in but it's it's not having it today so i'm not going to mess with this too much but now if i lay this one on top of the other two so i've got onion skin on and then i've got the drawing before this one and the drawing after this one and uh there we go. And then I lay this one on top of those other two. And if you do it just right, then you can in between 
between two drawings, like so. There we go. Yeah, close enough. I'll just do this just so I can demonstrate it and get it over with. Um, but again, this is something that when you're doing the cleanup pass is uh, essential. And that's one of the great things about Toon Boom. When it works is that um, I can compare these volumes now and make sure that this face is going to be the same size and just do a nice in between of the character like so and then the magic will happen in a minute where I take put them back on the pegs it takes two seconds and I got all this volume stuff worked out nicely Something like that. So now if I go back to my camera view, you can see that I was able to, to in between it, but I, by taking the drawings off the pegs and comparing the sizes, which is what we used to be able to do with discs, um, taking our drawings off the discs, and then now it, the sizes are, are the same because if you go back to this, they're laid on top of each other. And ordinarily, I said I could go in and I could rotate this and, and really get it to line up nicely, um, but it's just giving me grief today. But, but I could put this anywhere. And when I go back to my camera view, um, you see that it's, it's still sitting in place. And that gives you the ability to compare shapes and compare volumes when you're, uh, specifically when you're doing your cleanup pass. Like I said, it's, uh, better for the cleanup pass than it is for the rough pass because I don't really need to draw at that level of, I don't need to keep the volumes that consistent when I'm doing it this way. And uh, when I do the cleanup pass, I will absolutely need to do that. So, so with this one, I'm just gonna clean this up a little bit more and then move on to the next. And see how many I can knock of these I can knock out in the next, next half hour or so before our time is up. So you can see how this thing's going to look. There's some debate about when the cleanup pass as a separate sheet of paper actually took place. I have my theories. I happen to know the person who, well, I worked with the person who is credited as saying, hey, why don't we take a separate sheet of paper and draw over the top of the animator's roughs and we'll have a whole department that does nothing but that. And I'm pretty sure it happened in my time or right before my time, which was the 90s, um, the post Little Mermaid era of animating. I'm pretty sure that that's when uh, that's when they really refined this idea of oh well let's do it with a separate sheet of paper instead of having animators draw right on the animators roughs which you see in things like the Aristocats uh, the scratchy era of the Walt Disney films they at some point said we'll, we'll do a really nice clean drawing and um, we'll do it on a separate sheet of paper. And again, I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to say who came up with it um, because I'm not 100% sure. And again, don't want to drop names. At least not today. Talk to me in one of my classes and maybe I will. <laughs> um, when I'm not uh, I'm being recorded and throwing this out into the world. Um, but yeah, I was around when they were making that into a uh, specific thing when they were actually, uh, when cleanup became its own separate entity and there would be whole departments, whole groups of people who were, did nothing but clean up all day, which used to be animation assistant work and, and an entry level into the business of being an animator. Okay. This next one will be a fun frame because it's a smear where I'm exaggerating the character because it's moving so quickly from here to here. From this one to the next one, I just look the keys themselves. 
So from there to there, it's a pretty big jump. So I'm gonna do a smeared frame and it almost doesn't matter what I do with it, um, but it uh, will look better if I make it a little more tight. And then of course, when 2D fell out of fashion, they stopped doing the whole thing altogether. And again, that's a story for someone else to tell, but uh, the cleanup department was decimated and unceremoniously asked to leave from any studio where they had it. And they just said, well, that's the end of that. We're not doing this anymore. And it's really heartbreaking. It's, it's very sad. But the good news is, is that they, uh, it's coming back. And there are lots of really cool jobs in animation right now for people who are excited about the business of animation or just the art of animation. Two separate things, but uh, there's room for people now that there wasn't before. There's sort of a renaissance going on at the moment with various companies becoming more interested in 2D animation again. Uh, so it's great. It's one of the number one things that I'm asked about in, when I teach non 2D animation classes is, is 2D animation something that I can do? And my answer is always, yes, of course you can. Can you get paid for it? That I don't know. <laughs> That's that remains to be seen. But um, certainly uh, there's room for people who want to do animation in hand-drawn analog style. I'm going to add another drawing here because it's moving so fast. So I'll just stick another one in between here. And I've met all sorts of students who want to do all sorts of different things. Some want to do clay animation and some want to do stop motion uh, cutouts, um, puppet work, sort of like they do at, is it Leica? I grew up in Oregon and so uh, Leica used to be Will Vinton Studios. Um, and uh, then it became like a, and it became, I'm afraid to say, a little more corporate than it was when I was a kid. But uh, but they're still going, and they've made some really good movies. Now here's something that's kind of a fun little quirk with. Tune Boom that I don't talk about too often because it's annoying and I'm trying to be positive, but uh, sometimes when you draw in Tune Boom, watch what happens. I just draw something and look, it just disappears. And that is just one of the, um, one of the drawbacks of any software program is that you have to keep your eye on things and save often. Um, so I'm going to open this up again. I'm going to shut it down, open it up, save it, open it up again, it won't take too long. Um, meanwhile, I've got a question, which is what are your favorite 2D shows and movies currently? <laughs> well, I was a big fan of, of uh, Klaus because it was old school. It spoke to my uh, classic animation 2D heart in the way that it took what we used to do and expanded upon it and made it even um, made it even more lush than it was when we were doing it. I look at the movies that we worked on when I was in the business and I actually kind of cringe sometimes. It's like, ah, oh, we just didn't quite get there. Didn't quite get it to the perfection. Well, Klaus does. Um, so that's something that I watch a lot. Um, I try to keep up with what's happening more than that I actually physically watch things. The perfect honest truth is, is I don't have a lot of time to watch anything. So all I watch is clips. So I watch short subjects. Um, I watch the Pixar stuff and you know, all the CG animated films. Um, but a lot of short stuff on 
YouTube is, is where I get my inspiration. I see what people are doing in groups, Facebook groups and things for animation. And I'm just blown away by what people do with their free time. If I'd had half the resources that they, that people have nowadays to, to be able to create their own animation, I would have probably done a feature film by now. But as it happens, I already did short films. Uh, yeah, Klaus. Um, why did it go away? If you're asking why 2D went away, it was because of money. Um, the 2D films weren't making a lot of money and the CG films were in Hollywood. We'll make whatever people will pay to see. I'm not being cynical, it's the truth. It's a business and, and Hollywood will pay whatever people will pay to see how we'll continue to make more of it. So um, if they make a film in 2D animation and, and people pay money and they'll see it, then they'll go. Klaus unfortunately went directly to Netflix. It was still popular, it still did well, but it wasn't a film released in theaters. And so it didn't have the box office clout that say a Pixar film does that comes out and everybody goes and sees it three times and everybody on the planet goes and sees it three times and they make lots of money and everybody's happy and they make another Toy Story or whatever. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, yes. So, um, referencing that, there was a comment now, oh, the lines that you had to re up in the scene. Yeah, save, save, save. It's just like anything else. Um, I only lost a little bit of a drawing I was starting. I'm going to play this section just so you can see where I'm at right now. All right, I'll just play the whole thing. So you can see it's a little bit smoother through here now because I added an extra drawing. And that's what I want for this whole scene with the monster. The monster was still a little bit choppy. So I'm adding drawings as I go. Um, in fact, let's just grab a scene sequence. Let's grab a little section of it. I'll focus on that because it's fun. So this section is moving pretty fast and could use a little bit of love. So I'm going to add another drawing in here, but first I'm going to clean this one up a little bit because it's pretty rough. Another question I get asked is, do I love 2D more, 3D more? And the answer is yes. Um, I love it all. I just love motion graphics. I have ever since I was a kid, just been entranced with breathing life into stuff that wasn't alive. Um, it's a way of acting without actually having to be an actor because I'm not by nature much of an exhibitionist. <laughs> I'm not uh, much of a person for clowning it up and being out there and telling jokes and such. But as an animator, you can do whatever you want and you can hide behind it. And there's nothing, I say this to my students, particularly when they start to get down towards the end of, say, for example, a demo reel class. <laughs> um, at the end of a demo reel class, um, you uh, find that you're starting to get kind of down and out. And I uh, completely forgot what I was talking about. Um, this, this, yeah, Siren's voice was, was referring to the lines you drew in tube when they disappeared. Yeah, and they had to reopen. Um, but uh, yeah, that's why I just say save often. You get to know this stuff pretty quickly. You begin to figure out really quickly when you should probably say something because you have been working on something for a while and uh, you don't want to lose it. So every few drawings or every few lines of a drawing, I'll just save. And usually I'll save using the uh, hotkeys, but sometimes I'll save just to remind people, oh yeah, file, save, uh, control S, yes, or just go up there and do it periodically. So 
So yeah, just cleaning this drawing up a little bit. And then I'm gonna in between it so that it looks flows a little bit more nicely. Again, anything I add to this will give the persistence of vision, make it look like it's flowing a little bit nicer, but I don't have to overdo it. I'm also trying things out with this character as I go. Since I just kind of made this thing up on the fly. And I'm drawing some anatomy lines just to make sure that it stays fairly consistent. All right, so now I have enough information I can go in and lay in and in between between these two because that's a pretty big jump. And it looks pretty odd. So just lower the onion skinning a little bit and then just lay in really rough in between here. Don't need to overdo it. It's on ones. It's barely going to show. So as long as there's a placeholder here representing the outlines of the outside of the face and showing the path of these antennae, antennae. One thing that I always say when it comes to animation is um, just keep doing it and you will just naturally get a little bit better every time you do it because you'll be able to see the difference between something that is uh, where you started when you were first starting animation and something that's progressed further. Um, all the best animators I knew grew up without any books and um, no, not, not, not any books. There were some books, but uh, there was a book by Preston Blair. There was Illusion of Life in the 80s. Um, so there were some resources, but I think of them as resources. As wonderful as Illusion of Life is, I still think of it more as a, a memoir of how things were and how they got to where things were. And a lot's changed since you know, the 30s, 40s, and 50s when, when Frank and Ollie were animating. I'm not saying in any stretch that the book doesn't have value. It's gold. It's, it's a Bible for animation enthusiasts. But more and more as time goes on, it's becoming more of a memoir and less of a technical book. And the Richard Williams book is great for 2D, but it's also it's in a sp specific style that Richard Williams was very comfortable with. And, um, you know, if you're into anime, for example, you know, is it is learning how to do a walk cycle on ones the way that he did it, is that going to help you? I don't know. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. That's, you know, neither here nor there. The point is, is that we didn't have those resources when we were learning animation, a lot of us. And so combination of oral history, having somebody tell you things and, and say, you know, oh, this is how you do an in-between. You don't do it like that. Or this is an in-between at all. For example, I did my first short film um, in animation, which I think you can find it online, but I'm not going to go on and on about it because it's not that good. Uh, I show it to my classes sometimes. I show it to friends, understanding friends. Um, I, I am also not ashamed of it. I think it turned out really nice for what it was, but I didn't know how to do in-betweens. And it wasn't until I got in the business and somebody said, oh, this is how you in-between something and show the proper arc. For example, on this thing, um, you know, how do you know to do a circle that stays on a proper arc like that. Or if, if the antenna is up here in one drawing and down here in this drawing, how do you know, well, we should probably should favor that one instead of favoring the other one, unless you're doing a slow end or something. Uh, arcs, how do you know to draw a hand on an arc so that in one sense, it's, you know, that's the worst, worst hand I probably could ever have drawn, but I'm trying to do it really fast. But, you know, it's down here. Uh, this is drawing one, this is drawing three. Well, where's drawing two as far as an in-between goes? Well, all these parts of the hand have an arc and you have to make sure and respect that arc and 
you know, put the fingers in the appropriate place, put the thumb in the appropriate place, and then tie it all together and make it look like it's actually all one drawing and not a series of drawings that are strobing. And then that's how you get drawing number two. Um, but you had to know there was an arc there. If you were to, for example, if I cut and paste this, if you're to place this drawing here, it's not going to look right. If you place it way out here, it's not going to look right. If you place it too much close to this one, it's going to look different than if you put it too close to this one. Um, and so knowing instinctively that this is where it was supposed to be uh, is something that just took lots and lots of training. I didn't know any of that stuff um, just based on the books that I read. Plus Preston Blair, um, I don't even remember what all of them were, but Preston Blair was a big one. Illusion of Life was another big one where uh, we gleaned what we could from these books, but ultimately it wasn't until I got into the business that I had people say, oh, no, no, no that's how you do it. And was able to progress rapidly from there. So fortunately we have these animation classes now available and it makes a huge difference. People don't have to go through what I went through. Um, they can actually learn from what we learn and have us teach you some things and you can avoid some of the mistakes that we made because we just didn't know any better because we were getting started in the business. I think it's okay for me to say that one of my first mentors was Dale Bear, who was uh, one of the people who were taught by the original Nine Old Man, or, or some of them anyway. And as far as I know, he's still at Disney and still animating and still pretty much an animation legend. And one of the nicest people I ever met in the business, uh, he actually, uh, I shouldn't say this, I don't think he'd care, but I mean, he babysat my cat. I'm like, I was in my 20s and just getting started in the business and I had a cat and I was going away for Christmas and, he, and I said, I don't know what to do if I should hire a sitter or I can't take it with me, maybe I'd take it to a friend's house. And Dale Bear, legendary animator, cool person all around and just great, nice person said, oh, I'll watch your cat for you. I love cats and I love taking care of animals and I'd be happy to come over and <laughs> sit with your cat and play with it for a while. And uh, that just shows you what a family environment uh, animation was out when I got in the business, at least at this particular studio. Um, yeah, lucky cat. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, so I'm going to now draw another drawing. I've got about 15 minutes left here. I want to put one more drawing in between and just show that. Uh, I'm making this more and more smooth with each drawing that I add and with each cleaned up drawing that I add to this. It's just fleshing the movement out of this creature who's supposed to be kind of soft and squishy. And then in just a few minutes, I'm going to put it all together and show the whole thing again where it stands and wrap it up. So in the future, I'll probably have some more of the character cleaned up and then I'll probably work some more on this character and start cleaning this thing up too and then putting it together. And um, I've got some other scenes that I'm working on as well. I have other scenes that I've started in Twitch sessions. So I'll be working on those too, just to keep things lively. I've got one that's almost done. I'm just doing a cleanup pass on it on a Disney-ish looking character. And maybe next time what I'll do is I'll just show some of the other scenes that I'm working on and uh, where they're at and talk about them a little bit. As far from an animation standpoint, what's what do they require? But today I just wanted to play around with this scene a little bit more and flesh it out a little bit more. So I'll do one more of these clean up, tie down rough animation drawings on ones. I don't want to do the whole thing on ones because that's just going to take too much time and effort. And it really won't matter because this thing's flopping around and flashing around 
and I want you to be looking at the superhero dude as much or more. So, uh, it's okay if this thing is a little bit on the strobey side. If I was Richard Williams, I wouldn't let it go. It would have to all be on ones, it would have to all be perfectly rendered with lots and lots of line mileage. He had a tendency to, um, uh, Richard Williams, he had a tendency to start out really strong and then, uh, I shouldn't say this, well, he's gone, but I mean, and, and, and there's no discounting his work, but um, he had a tendency to work uh, with these really high ambitions at the beginning of his films, and then he wouldn't be able to finish them off because he was so meticulous and working so hard on making sure everything was on ones and everything was uh, full of lines. So if you look at uh, Raggedy Ann and Andy, the motion picture, or musical adventure, whatever it's called. I happen to really like it. It's a trip. It's really, really crazy. Um, but uh, if you watch the quality of the film changes over the course of, if you consider this whole thing, um, it changes over the course of the movie. And by the end, the characters are not quite as detailed as they were at the beginning. And then he did another one called Ziggy's Christmas Gift or something. Great animated short, but um, again sort of changes as it goes it starts to the detail starts to lessen and then of course there was this thief in the cobbler which is legendary and taken over by don bluth studios being a witch and finished um, without his consent and without his approval unfortunately so now i'm playing this at speed with some of it on ones i probably will put in a little bit more ones i'll definitely put in some more cleanup uh, on these it's not ready to go for a cleanup pass yet um, there's still a lot of the drawings uh the changing volumes in the face and the head in ways i don't really want it to the body i think looks all right looks pretty squishy now i'm going to add the tentacle layer so uh, that's something else that i want to work on a little bit more um, probably add a little more life to some of the tentacles so that they're flopping around a little faster or doing curly cues. I might do that next time. That could be fun. Um, and then obviously, like I said, working on the superhero and making sure that uh, that character is nice and clean because I think it's going to really pop. Uh, but that's everything put together in case you missed it from the start. That's everything so far. And then obviously, I said there's a background that goes with it too. And I believe that's all I'm going to cover for today. Uh, I appreciate you guys hanging out with me. It's been fun. I appreciate the questions. That's always uh, always fun to know that people are actually out there and, and uh, interested in paying attention to all this stuff so uh, much appreciated like i said come back again and you'll see this progressing further and then next time i will show some of the other scenes that i'm working at as well some of the other scenes that i'm working on as well um thank you simon thank you i appreciate you guys hanging out with me tonight for the late night edition of twitch i should have a drink in my hand right all i've, all I've got is a bottle of water sorry but the late night chill version of Twitch. Um, thanks again for hanging out with me and uh, participating. Cool. All right. So I will just see you next time. Stay well, be safe, and enjoy some of the other Twitch sessions. See you next time.